Okay, everyone. Uh, good morning and uh, welcome again to the Lake Orient Football Club annual general meeting. I'm Nigel Travis, uh, your chairman, and this is going to be a first for me. I'm sure the first for you and first for many people in football. Uh, we live in incredibly unusual times. Uh, so what we wanted to do is to make sure that we connect uh, we connect uh, with all our fans and most importantly all our shareholders because this is your meeting and when we bought the club back in 2017 we promised to have regular communication with all our shareholders um, as i say it is primarily for the shareholders but today given the very strange times we've invited our fans as well the supporters who've worked so hard to support this club through the last three years, we think it's absolutely critical that they have the chance to ask us a few questions today. Uh, we will, however, try and make sure that we've got preference given to our shareholders. That will be a little bit difficult, but we're going to try and do, th do that. So later on, when we have the question and answer, uh, we will be in a situation where Luke Lambourne will read out the question and I will then pass it over to the uh, person that um, I think is most appropriate to take the question. When you have a question to ask, I think the best thing for you to do is to look on the right hand side of your screen and you'll find a question mark box. Uh, we ask you to Put the question in there. We do have some questions already and, and we intend to answer a lot of questions today. But one big request is, is that you fill in your name with your question. We'd like to know who it's coming from, obviously. Um, what I'd also say is that we're going to keep everyone on mute for two reasons. One is we don't want people interrupting because this is quite a logistical challenge. And secondly, we want to make sure that there is no feedback from other people speaking uh, on the virtual calls, which I'm sure we've all had over the last few weeks. There's a tendency to hear what's being said in the background. So we're trying to improve the quality. So I'm now going to move to the formal part. And the first thing I want to do is to introduce the board and then I'm going to go on to some key staff members. Uh, and I want to remind everyone that this is a business meeting. It's more about the business of Lake Orient Football Club rather than what we do on the field. Obviously, what we do on the field is very important, but we also have a business that is behind everything that takes place on the pitch. So I'm going to introduce the board members one by one. I'm going to say a few words about them and then they're actually going to say a few words themselves and I'll try and tell you where they're speaking in from. Uh, obviously, I'm introducing myself, Nigel Travis, chairman, very happy to be chairman. And before anyone asks me the question, I am still very happy to be the chairman of Lake Orient Football Club. Uh, I'm excited about the future, despite the challenges we have. And I think the challenges we will take advantage of, like we have over the last two or three years when we've had some significant challenges ourselves. So I'm phoning in today from Massachusetts, Wellesley, Massachusetts, and looking forward to an excellent meeting. So with that, I now go over to our vice chairman, principal shareholder, great supporter of Leighton Orient. And as I always say, the best person I've ever met for connecting with the fans. So that's our vice chairman, principal shareholder, Kent Teague from Texas. Hello, everyone. Um, the thing I miss the most is being in Layton, seeing all of you around the ground, uh, seeing you at the Supporters Club, in the South Stand Bar before the game, in and around the, the stadium. And I really miss the traveling fans being in the away end with you guys. So, you know, up the O's, and we really look forward to a good meeting today. Thanks. Hello everyone. Um, I think you possibly 
we're supposed to be listening to Nigel then, but he was on mute. But I've been told by the wonders of another piece of technology that he was introducing me. So um, hopefully you can see me. Hopefully you're all well. Uh, we're missing seeing you at the Brea Group Stadium. Uh, and if you're not missing seeing us, then hopefully you're missing seeing the boys play at least. Uh, it's obviously very difficult times for everybody at Leighton Orient and um, I can assure you that everybody behind the scenes is doing everything they can to make sure that the club is in the best possible shape that it can be when some form of normality resumes. Clearly you're going to have a lot of questions this afternoon about when that's going to be and what shape it's going to take and we'll do our best to answer as honestly as we can but clearly you must uh, understand and I'm sure you do that there are a lot of unanswered questions at the moment and these are very difficult and unprecedented times for everybody to do with Leighton Orient. Um, as I say, the main thing is that I hope you're all well. Those of you that are still able to, to work, I hope you're managing to stay safe. And to all our key worker supporters, especially a big thanks from uh, from all of us for everything you're doing in, in uh, whichever field you're working in at this time. Uh, I'm not entirely sure who I'm going to pass over to now. So hopefully Nigel is not on mute anymore and can uh, resume his talk to you all. But I wish you all the best and hope to see you soon. OK, it was a surprise to me that I was on mute, but anyway, I'm not now. And what I said to introduce Matt is he still makes a tremendous contribution. Uh, he's obviously not CEO anymore. That's Danny's role. But Matt really does uh, stay very involved with the club and his insights, having been on the Football League board, are, are terrific. So, Matt, thank you for your piece. I'm now going to go over to David Travis, who uh, most of you will know as my son. Uh, streaming is going to become even more important in the future of football. And he's, for those who don't know, he's a leader in the stream with his day job with Ericsson. So pass over to you, David. Hi there. Uh, yeah, good to see you all, uh, although I can't see you face to face. Um, yeah, just say hello. Uh, welcome to this uh, good trial of technology, uh, which we're very proud to say that we try and be at the forefront of what we do very much. Um, yeah, there's been lots of work going on in the background uh, to try and get things back to normal as soon as possible. And uh, we look forward to answering your questions. We've been working with the league on lots of options um, and we'll see what comes out of this crisis. But I hope you're all staying safe and we look forward to seeing you back at the ground as soon as possible. OK, so David, thank you. And now I'd like to introduce a person who, as I always say when I introduced him, knew nothing about football about three years ago. He now knows a lot about football uh, and he's the furthest away today. He's calling in from Denver, Colorado, 7.15 in the morning. So pass over to Rich Emmett. Hi, everyone. I, I share uh, good wishes for good health and, and safety. I hope everyone is doing well. And uh, like you all, I have a huge hole in my Saturdays. And I'm still trying to figure out what to do with it. So uh, let's hope we get through this unscathed, both from a health perspective and with regard to the club and the league. And uh, we move forward to some sense of normalcy in the not too distant future. So uh, do appreciate your continued support. We will come out of this and we look forward to great things to come in uh, perhaps the rest of this year, but uh, certainly in years in the future. So thank you. Hey Rich, thank you very much and thank you for all you do. And then another big contributor on the board who uh, was originally the acting CEO when we took over the club. He's now got multiple businesses that he's involved in and those insights that he gains from those businesses are very helpful at Lake Orient Football Club, particularly on the retail side. So I'd now like to introduce Marshall Taylor. Hello and good afternoon everyone. Um, so I sit, uh, in regard to my role, I'm the club director that actually sits on the board of the Leighton Orient Trust as well. So at the moment I'm helping the trust to navigate um, this difficult time that it's also finding itself in, uh, as well as the club. Uh, and my other large project for the last 12 months has obviously been, as the club has taken the retail arm of the business back in house, um, I have helped um, set that up uh, and oversee the running of that. So that has been the, the big uh, project for myself over the last 12 months. So if there's any questions in relation to the trust or to our retail, hopefully I'll be able to answer those over the course of this presentation. Thank you. OK, so that's our board. I'd now like to introduce the two executives who run the club day to day. Uh, 
the first one you're going to hear a lot about because he's got a presentation coming up right after this and that's Danny Macklin and uh, and you know it was interesting that we were talking about Danny Kent and I the other day it was a man for a crisis we've got him and Danny has managed to go from working 20 hours a day to 22 uh, we're still wondering what he does with the other two hours a day so Danny uh, brief introduction from yourself please yeah, good afternoon, everyone. I won't re repeat the great comments that the board have uh, just made uh, as introductions and rightly so the, the health message. Uh, you're going to hear enough from me uh, in a moment during the presentation, but I hope it's informative, uh, educational, a bit thought provoking. Uh, but first and foremost, I hope you and your families are well. OK, so Danny looks after one side of the club. The other half of the club is looked after by Martin Ling, who has had an incredibly busy uh, year. Uh, if you recall when we had our last meeting just over a year ago, a year and about three days, uh, we just were on the verge of promotion. Well, we achieved promotion back to the Football League. We went to the trophy final. Unfortunately, we lost that. But even more importantly, we lost our head coach very sadly after that. And at this point, before I introduce Martin Ling, I'd just like to have a 15 second break just to remember Justin Edinburgh who of course took us back to the Football League, achieved great great things for Leighton Orient and of course was a personality we all very sadly missed. So a 15 second pause here in memory of Justin. OK, so the person who's had to handle a really difficult year before we had the COVID-19 crisis uh, with all the ups and downs and handling the players, handling the coaches and keeping the team on track all the way through is Martin Ling. So good morning, Martin. Morning, Nigel, and morning, everybody, or afternoon as it is in England. Uh, I think the one word uh, that is needed for all this season has been adaptability. Uh, we've had to adapt uh, of the sad loss of Justin, as Nigel rightly said, uh, and then we've had to adapt again to the, the COVID-19 crisis. And, and it's a it's a day by day uh, adaptability at the moment. We're getting different information uh, in terms of what the season looks like going forward. What season? What the season looks like next year? But the one thing uh, I can honestly say is that we've got uh, a board of directors and, and, and a group of staff that that's prepared to adapt to whatever's put in front of us and to come out with the right answers. And uh, supporters, you're with us all the way. So uh, we look forward to whatever it may be in the next year. It, let's just hope that adaptability is not needed over the next year. But if it is needed, we will use it. Martin, uh, thank you for all you do. And that was uh, a great summation of what this year has been a difficult year. But I want to remind everyone that the annual meeting this year actually reflects on the successful year we had in the year 2018 to 19. But moving back to this year, a person who has shown unbelievable adaptability, as Martin just said, and I think incredible flexibility and is also now our head coach and I'm truly hoping it's going to take us to stronger and better places next year is Ross Embleton. Ross, good afternoon. Thank you Nigel. Uh, afternoon and afternoon uh, to everybody that's on. I think first and foremost thank you for coming on. My first experience of any AGM, so it's uh, certainly a unique one. But I think uh, to touch on some of the words that everybody said there, and certainly what Martin's talked about, is um, there's been a lot of uniqueness amongst everything that's gone on this year. Um, but I think the one thing that um, if we if we do go back to a number of the memories that we that we take from Justin, the word togetherness was one that he was. Um, huge on and something that he, he was so keen for his, his squad and his club to to have as part of it. And I think the togetherness uh, of of the group and the players and the staff, um, which is obviously my concern first and foremost, but I think together with, with the fantastic board and support that we have from the top of the club, we feel it was right away 
through to uh, the way that they try to communicate with you, the, uh, the shareholders and the supporters is fantastic. So I think that's been something that, again, during this, this period and this difficult time, we've seen from, from the whole of the club. I think the thing from my point of view today is to uh, express to you all that everybody now in terms of the players and the staff are all, um, I say, fit and well. Obviously, we don't have our hands on them at the moment to know exactly how, you know, how they're looking. But um, the reports that we get from them every day are suggesting that everybody's in a good place from um, from the perspective of, of those that suffered at the beginning of this uh, this period and the reports that came out that a couple of the players certainly were um, were tested and it came back that they had the had the virus. So from that perspective, everybody's staying well. Um, and I think, you know, to reflect some of the other things that we've just said there, frustrating times, difficult times, but it's important that we remember that everybody's uh, safety, sanity and well-being is, is the thing that's, you know, has to be at the forefront of everything that we do. Uh, let's hope we're back building on some of the momentum that we started to find before this break uh, and we can find that whatever normal is going to be with regards to football uh, as soon as possible. But take care, everybody, and um, here's, to, here's to seeing everyone soon. Ross, uh, thank you for all you do and thank you for uh, moving us up the table as we sit here. I think we're still in 17th spot and have been there for some time. Um, so we'll see what happens for the rest of the season. So the last person I want to introduce is someone whose face is new to you. Uh, and when I reflect on our time of two and three quarter years, I think we made one big mistake, which was not hiring someone like this person right up front. Uh, Simon Blake uh, joined the club late last year. He's our financial advisor. He's not a shareholder. He's not an employee of the club and his impartiality has been fantastic. Simon has a great financial background in a number of companies. Uh, he's a very avid sportsman, particularly in golf, but not football. And in many ways, that's an advantage because he gives us an outside view looking in. And I truly wish we'd had his specializations uh, on hand uh, earlier in our tenure. He's worked very well with Lindsay Martin, who's taken over the finance role and done an absolutely spectacular job. Uh, and I feel a lot better about the control of our finances than I felt in our time at the club. So I'm just going to introduce him for the first time to all of you, Simon Blake. Thank you, Nigel. That's a, a lovely introduction. Um, yes, I've been with the club uh, since December, so still relatively new and also relatively new to football. I have to say, though, I've worked with quite a few management teams in the past, and, and this is the, the most passionate uh, management team that I've worked with, all of the directors. Um, and uh, I think as we look forward, things are going to remain relatively tough, but there will be good times ahead. And the companies that thrive and survive will be the ones that are properly managed and look for the opportunities. I think Leighton Orient is ideally suited to that. Thank you. Thank you, Simon. Uh, and I just want to talk about a couple of other groups now because this is a family and a team effort all together. And I, I'd firstly like to call out uh, Leighton Orient Supporters Club, who've done, as always, a spectacular and stellar job supporting us. They reached out right at the start of the crisis, and we thank them uh, for their ongoing contributions to Leighton Orient football. So thank you to the Supporters Club. And we've also had a number of very good, constructive discussions with Loft, Loft and the club are engaged in very good uh, discussions about how they can help us as we navigate into the future. And, and I think it's worth taking the point here of saying, in my view, if I stand back from, the, from it, COVID-19 is a, a rare event that happens in history. It's a bit like World War II with the amount of change that's happening. And the way we're kind of looking at the club, we're trying to look forward is what's today like the day after tomorrow so in other words the short to medium term and then post the crisis and what i will tell you all three of those stages the club and football will be very different so loft are engaged with us in thinking about how they can make a contribution to those changes and we continue some very good discussions with them the last group i want to mention is our sponsors who've been heavily engaged, in fact, in the last week or so, 
We thank them for their ongoing support. Uh, they are a major revenue generator for the club and we thank them, many of whom are Leighton Orient fans, for their ongoing support. So, the last bit of formal business is that the directors approve the accounts. You will have the opportunity to ask questions about the accounts. Uh, Danny's going to go through some detail. Um, some of the numbers I don't like, and I'm sure you won't like, this is for the shareholders, but we will explain as much as we can and principally in explaining it, if you have any detailed technical questions, we'll ask Simon to help us out. Um, but before I finish, I just want to underscore the priority for everyone going through the next period of time is, as a number of people have said, the health and safety of everyone at the club, our employees with whom we speak on a twice weekly basis in a formal fashion, but day to day, as Ross mentioned. Uh, we're obviously concerned about all our supporters and we're right now reaching out to a number of supporters who we believe may need help. So this is an active action that's taking place in the club. And finally, everyone in football. So we hope we can get through this crisis. At times, we're all a bit pessimistic about it and we've got to hope for a vaccine and the opportunity to test antibodies, etc. But in the meantime, We've got to be very flexible and keep adjusting our business model to what's going on in the outside world. So with that, that concludes the formal part of the meeting. Uh, we're collecting your questions. Remember to put your name down and we will go through an extensive Q&A after Danny's presentation. So with that, I'm going to go on mute uh, actually uh, uh, right now and pass over to Danny, who will take you through the presentation. OK, thank you, Nigel. Luke, if you can just confirm that it's working with the tagging up and down, yeah? Yeah, that's working fine, Danny. OK, so today we're going to discuss, obviously, we are focused on the 2018-19 actuals that will form part of the uh, presentation in terms of the highlights and the observations of that. A little bit of look at the finances as we stand at the moment, the finances, challenges and opportunities into next season, the impact that COVID-19 is going to have, what we can envisage at the moment in the short, medium and long term, as Nigel just alluded to, and what we as a club can do moving forward, what the game can do to reset itself and what fans can do to further help what they're already doing before we conclude with the Q&A. So in the 2018-19 financial year that we're looking back on, which ended on the 30th of June last year, Clearly, as we said, we achieved promotion in the second season, which was at least one, if not two years ahead of that schedule. Uh, obviously, we suffered the tragic passing of Justin. During the financial year, we, before of 2017-18, we had an actual loss of 2.34 million. We had budgeted to have a loss last year of 2.1 million. Uh, that actually came out a lot higher, as Nigel alluded to, at 2.71 million. But that did include nearly 200,000 of exceptional costs that have not been fully accounted for in the previous year. Our operating loss, therefore, before exceptional costs was 2.5 million versus 2.3 million from the previous year, which was an increase of 180,000 at just over 7%. As Nigel alluded to as well, we've done a major change, uh, much needed changes to our accounting processes, both internally and externally. And again, I'd like to pass those plaudits on to Lindsay, who's doing a sterling job along with everything else she was previously doing as club secretary. Uh, and also welcome and, and thank Simon for everything he's done and will do in the future. So from a revenue point of view, last year we saw revenues increase from 2.4 million to 2.9. That was an increase of 21%, 500,000. Uh, that was aided by season ticket sales of 4,200. A growth in non-match day income from 50 to 100, 150,000, and our average home attendance at the Brow Group Stadium was 5,445. That led to an improvement in match day spend in the bars and in the catering, the program, retail, etc., of a further 40% increase, which was much welcomed. And our transfer fee income increased by a staggering 412,000, and we enjoyed record retail sales in what was our last year in our partnership with Just Sport. And as we mentioned, and we'll expand upon in a moment, we had the full introduction and growth of our streaming platform. From an expenditure point of view, our cost of sales increased to 8% and that was a £40,000 increase, delivering a gross profit of 2.73 million against 2.27 from the previous year. 
the headline movements in terms of expenditure versus the previous year. There was an increase in wages and salaries, largely because of the promotion of performance related bonuses of 800,000, an increase in rent rates and utilities of 136,000, and owing to some essential maintenance work within the stadium, specifically in uh, GI Pre uh, East End, we had an increase of 59,000 in that area. And our insurances, predominantly through medical insurances, increased by 64,000, but we did have a reduction in certain costs, such as legal and accountancy fees, of 110,000. So our finances in 2019-20, we set the original objectives of stability on and off the pitch to reduce the loss, and we were estimating prior to the impact of COVID-19 that loss to be within the region of 2 million. So we've gone from 2.7 to 2 million, and we'll get to what we were expecting that to be for the next season in a moment. So when we started playing on the 7th of March, whenever the last day was, I think it was then, season ticket sales were 4,300, uh, so an increase on the previous year of just over 100, and the average attendance at the Brad Group Stadium had gone up again to 5,504 home league games, and our non-match day revenue had increased to 300,000 estimate, which is basically on the back of a number of events. Uh, you obviously saw us. Uh, we were the host for the ITV uh, Harry's Heroes thing. Uh, that was a big event that we hosted. Uh, pitch hires, other TV events that were filmed, one of which you will see this summer on your uh, televisions. Uh, commercial and hospitality incomes rose again by 25%. Uh, we extended a number of key commercial partners, including that with Brower Group. I'd like to extend a special thanks to all of our commercial partners uh, that have been with us for the last few years and I think will be with us for many years to come. Our match day secondary spend increased by another 25% and we witnessed 25% growth in the season so far for our first year uh, with the shop and with New Balance and as well as the work that Marshall's done, I'd like to praise very much Lucy Freeman who's moved into the role of joint ticketing and retail manager. And we, we've been witnessing even at record sales even during the lockdown mode as people take advantage of some phenomenal offers we've had online. And again, we've in our second year of streaming and obviously our first year of streaming back in the EFL, We've had immense success with that and a huge platform for us to build on. And speaking of plat platforms to build on, Luke and other parts of the team have launched our first entry into eSports, which has been a phenomenal must have introduction we have, which we can expand upon in future years. So in terms of the impact of COVID-19, uh, now we budgeted for next year, that's the 2020-21 financial year or season, if you want to look at it that way. We were budgeting and hoping for a loss of 1 million. Now, the impact that COVID-19 is going to have, the reality is at the moment there are many scenarios that can pan out and at the moment we continue in really encouraging the healthy dialogue with the EFL, with other clubs, chief executives, chairmen and owners to make sure that we understand all the potential scenarios that could pan out. But ultimately, we are at the, the mercy and patiently waiting on, on more news from, from the government. We understand that that, you know, we may know more in the coming weeks, but right now we have to be patient and plan for every single scenario. Obviously, there is a major impact on our revenues, which then has a knock on effect on our cash. Whilst we said clearly and rightly so, the health and well-being of the Orient family is prominent. We have to also place equal attention on the club's uh, financials in terms of cash management. Uh, we have to look at there might be scenarios where we are playing behind closed doors and because of social distances, perhaps for a period of time, we might be playing with a reduced crowd. But at the moment, we don't know those for certain. Uh, what we've got to be aware of is obviously the economy is going to be impacted, not just locally, nationally, but internationally as well. And that is going to have an impact on unemployment and potentially for the ability to, for companies and individuals to spend money where they may not have wanted to in the past. They will hope to be able to do so in the future. Whilst we are aware that the public will be craving live sport, but they'll be craving live sport in a safe environment. So COVID-19 has definitely proved the catalyst to which Nigel and Kent have sat on a number of groups with me with the EFL. Football must use this opportunity to reset itself at all levels. Expenditure is too high, wage bills are too high across the game and we have to address that. Uh, I'm sitting personally on a group that's the SCMP, which is the Salary Cost Management Protocol, and that is looking at putting in a fair, robust, workable salary cap in the hope that that will come in in the coming months ahead of next season. But as a game, we have to look at all of our expenditure, all of our income streams, and now thinking outside the box becomes more prominent and active as ever. So the future of LOFC. So clearly the management, as Martin alluded to, and as always hits the nail on the head, 
you're blessed as shareholders and as fans for the board that you've got behind you. Not only we're forward thinking, but we're thinking what could happen in worst case scenarios, probable scenarios and best case scenarios. By doing that, we'll be best set to manage through the coming weeks and months. There will be more importance across the game in terms of youth academies, and I think we will be the best set of many clubs in League One and League Two to cope with that and the way that that is managed through Martin Lewis and his team will allow us to stand in good steads. So we're looking at ways that we can not only reduce expenditure, but introduce new revenue streams, whether that's the use of our kitchens uh, for restaurants and more on that to follow, whether it's co-working and um, myself and Nigel and others have been working through that on how that might look, but that basically is the ability for people to do that thing, go back to work and be able to work in a environment that is safe People may not want to go right into central London or right into the city centre, but they might be uh, willing and able to work in a safe environment with practising social distancing in what's now a very common trend of co-working areas. And that is an area that we're looking at of introducing into the Braggrip Stadium in the near future. Other areas that we are looking at are self-storage. But again, we're always open to ideas on ways that we can improve what we're doing as well as introducing new income streams. So as ever, we are very much open to dialogue on that. You'll see on your screen now some of the areas that we are looking at to expand upon how we can make the club even more sustainable, even more viable and even more successful. So you'll see many of those that we've discussed before, but some of those soccer camps, academy fundraising, the crowdfunding that we've launched recently, but you'll see there's a number of bows to our arrows that we want to make sure we're striking to try and reduce our loss and that is absolutely critical that we do that. So I want to thank shareholders and fans for everything they've been doing so far. We are asked every single day I wake up to 20 or so uh, messages on Twitter or whatever it is of fans asking what can I do to help and I want to reach out and thank those that are doing that. Uh, so what can you do? Well we've already sold over 700 I think at the time of writing that's around about 750 now that have already renewed their season ticket for next year. Massive thanks to that, that helps massively in terms of the cash flow. We want people to take advantage of our new crowdfunding scheme. So that is a new scheme we launched last week that allows fans to effectively pre-buy things like the new home shirt, uh, to buy hospitality, to buy Pacific match tickets, et cetera, et cetera. And we really want uh, fans to get behind that in a much greater way. And percentage of those profits will be given to the NHS and I urge fans if they haven't seen that already to look at all of our social media channels as well as the website. So when streaming comes available uh, for, for the remainder of this season uh, and also certainly for next season, we're asking fans to make sure that if they haven't watched that before, that may be for a short period of time the only way they can watch games uh, is one scenario, but we want to make sure that you're spreading the word about streaming. It's an exciting opportunity we've got for current fans the football fans across the UK and across the world to watch what we call real football in the capital. We want you to be as active as possible as you can in promoting fixtures, promoting club events, using the stadium where possible, making use of our re retail outlet and we will be announcing soon next day delivery and we hope to be able to roll that out within the next uh, month or so. If you're working for your company, we know times are hard but becoming a club partner will be the best time to be able to do this. Make sure when you are back in the stadium, you use our bars, the catering, the supporters club, buyer program, etc. We're also going to shortly announce a new scheme where fans can uh, make a voluntary monthly donation to help fund our academy. And we will also be running various volunteer schemes that fans will be able to hear of news in the coming weeks. We collectively can and must, more importantly, become a sustainable club as one community, as one Orient. And then in return, what we're committed to, we're provide, committed to providing a football club that prides itself on its history, on its community, while striving to establish a sustainable model for the near future. Making every fan, every sponsor, every player, every staff member, every local resident, every client proud of what Leighton Orient Football Club means to them. We're seeking additional new investment, which Nigel will uh, expand upon in a moment and reaching out to football fans across the capital and across the home counties such as Essex, etc. We're a club that prides itself on thinking outside of the box, but above all else, we want to provide a safe as possible environment for everyone who visits the Brayer Group Stadium. Remember, there is only one Orient. Now, thank you for your time. I think, Nigel, if there's anything you want to expand upon then before we lead on to a Q&A. 
Uh, yeah, we've got a large number of questions, uh, but before I do, I just want to emphasize uh, that we intend to come out of this stronger and better and even more innovative. Uh, you know, I think it's going to be uh, very dependent on government guidance. And I have to say, I'm very impressed with the relationship I see between the EFL and the government departments. I think they clearly have all got an awful lot on their plate. And Rick Parry, who is the chairman of the EFL, the ex-CEO of Liverpool and the Premier League, in my view, and I think Danny and Kent's view is doing a spectacular job. Uh, sometimes it's like herding cats, but he does it in a wonderful way. Uh, and I think we will somehow get through this with his guidance. At Leighton Orient, though, you know, we're not going to rest. We, we intend to find new ways to find revenue to build our club up. We want to take advantage of the crisis to make sure that we are in a better position comparatively with other clubs when we come out of it. And, and the many programs that Danny went through, I think, are an illustration of that. Uh, we have facilities at the club and within the guidance of social distancing, we think we can take advantage of those for functions and some of the other ideas that Danny outlined. In terms of finding investors, I'm always looking for new investors. Uh, essentially, our, our basic requirement is that you have 500,000 is kind of the base investment that we're looking at. Uh, we've got other people we're talking to who may have more than that. But obviously, it's an interesting time for potential investors. And I've got some groups who are saying this is a bad time to invest. And I spoke to one group who's looking at investing across football clubs around the world who believe this is the best time ever to invest in football clubs. So uh, you can look at it many ways uh, when you have a crisis. And I know some investors in business generally look at it in the same polar opposite fashion. So with that, I think let's get you heard enough from us. Let's get out and get the questions. And I think we had 35 a few minutes ago. We may have even more now. And the way we're going to do this is that Luke Lambourne, who I want to introduce, Luke replaced Elliot, who went off to Bournemouth. Most of you haven't seen Luke, but he is the brains behind the FIFA competition that was unbelievably well accepted across the football. A great initiative. He came from AFC Fylde, who uh, well, one of our great rivals last year. He's already started extremely strongly, though I think he's only spent like three days at the stadium. Um, so uh, with that, Luke, you're going to introduce all the questions and then I will direct them to whoever's going to answer them. So over to you, Luke. Yeah, thanks, Nigel. Um, thanks, everyone, for, for joining us this afternoon. We've had um, plenty of questions in. Um, from social media um, and obviously loads um, in the chat box as well. So if you want to keep putting your questions in there and we'll we'll get through as many as we can. Um, the way it will work is I'll ask the questions to Nigel um, and then Nigel can from there um, maybe delegate to who he thinks is, is best place to answer. Um, so we'll start with one from, from Facebook from Karen Harrison who asked, um, we know a majority of the shareholders have AIM shares that are non-trading, but what is the process for transferring shares and their rights to a beneficiary when a shareholder dies? Who needs to be contacted and how long does this take? Okay, so I could take a good shot at that, but I think the best person to answer that is Danny, uh, because we have quite a few of these requests that come in on a regular basis. So over to you, Danny. Yeah, uh, thank you. That, those uh, requests in terms of shareholders switch over uh, effectively. We perhaps need to make clearer where that is, but it's some a project that Lindsay manages on a day-to-day -day basis, and we perhaps just need to make that clearer that as and when someone does need or want to switch over their uh, transfer, that process will make will make that a lot more clearer going forward. Thank you, Karen. Thank you for all that you do for the club, and uh, you know you're one of those people that really is, is is giving Leighton Orient a very strong backbone, so very much appreciated. So back to you, Luke. 
Yep, next one, um, again from, from social media, is from Simon Johns. He's asked, is there a cost-effective way that you can get half the supporters bar open for the 12.30 games on TV instead of 1pm? As I consistently have to go to another pub until half-time and then come down to the ground, costing the club my food and drink money. Uh, well, when I saw that question earlier, I thought this is wonderful. So I was about to mandate it. Then I got stopped and said, that's not the way we do business at Leighton Orient. So I will pass over to Danny, who is in charge of all those decisions. Yeah, I think we had two games last year where we had an operational issue. I don't know if it was a fire alarm or whatever it was. And another one where we had a few staff, should we say, turn up slightly late. That ain't happening again. As and when we are opening our gates at uh, Brow Group Stadium, we'll be opening potentially even uh, earlier. I, I don't want to have a situation where there's a fan outside willing and able to uh, buy a pint buy a program, et cetera, and not be able to. That, 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 that will never, ever happen again. Good stuff. Um, moving on then. Um, a couple from Twitter this time from Jamie Stripe. He said, Colchester have recently released some of their best players early to protect their overall business. Is that a worst case scenario that you would consider? OK, so uh, this is a complicated question. I'll start off and then I'm going to pass over to Martin. Um, so. As, a, as we've said a number of times, we've been on calls with all the other league clubs and uh, Colchester told us on those calls that they did that to be open with their players. They, they did that to try and give those players the best opportunity to find a new club. I believe them, but I think the, the point that was very well made by their chairman is that most clubs are funded by one individual's business or businesses you know many clubs have an owner who's done very well in business uh, or an entrepreneur that's done very well they have a number of businesses and obviously the crisis is affecting most businesses uh, i can actually think of some businesses that are actually doing really well uh, i'm i'm sure papa john's will say thank you to all the late orient fans who are clearly buying a lot of pizza but what i would say is most businesses are struggling and that obviously has a ramification on the club they're associated with. Colchester is one. Going back to Luke's old club, his chairman was on, ex-chairman was on uh, Talk Sport last week and made the same point, that he can't treat the football club more favourably than his other businesses. So I think this is going to be a trend. So in terms of Leighton Orient, we haven't yet agreed the budget for next season. Uh, Martin and I are in discussion all the time about it. And obviously, Ross is very engaged in that discussion as well. We want to have a competitive squad, but we need to assess the situation for next season before we finalise our budget. Our budgets, Danny and I have been through several times. We have a very bad case budget, which obviously reflects on all budgets within the club. but. The quick answer to your question is we don't foresee us having to do anything radical, but we obviously need to keep an eye on the overall situation. So over to Martin. Yeah, I'll just follow Nigel down. In terms of uh, the club squad at the moment, the playing squad is that we've got 20 players that are in contract for next season and we've got eight players that are out of contract. If the season would have fin finished on its normal time, we'd have had to told them by third Thursday of May in terms of our intentions. Uh, but we will not be making decisions on them eight players until we get some sort of clarity uh, what's happening with the football going forward. We think that's important uh, and we feel that that's the best way to do it. And the, 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 the league rules have, have changed to, to make sure we can do that and implement that. So we won't be doing anything early, as Nigel said, but in the same breath, to be fair to the players, uh, once we know a decision on the f on what the football looks like going forward, then we feel we have to make a decision we, on our players going forward. Uh, and, and we will be clear and concise with that. You know, me and Ross have, uh, have talked at that for, in terms of what we're doing and how we're going to do things. But uh, it's about how the club looks and what the budget looks like for next year that's important to see who fits and what pieces of jigsaw fit, fit into the right uh, into the right puzzle. Martin, uh, thank you. I think what I would also say is 
that the players have been fantastic during this time. Uh, we we don't have a distinction between players and the rest of the employees at the club. They all come to the same meetings every two weeks. And one of the things that we did at our last meeting was ask players for ideas for revenue to help the club. And we had three come, come in from players. So, you know, I think you should feel proud with the contribution that our players are making. And we want to treat them in the best possible way going forward. So, Luke, back to you. <clears throat> yep, the next one is from Daniel Gold, who has asked, what is the situation with rent on the stadium? Is there either a discount or deferral taking place? And what is the situation with it going forward if we cannot play games with fans? OK, so uh, we are very fortunate, and I've said this before, that our president's pension fund happens to be our landlord. So that's a great situation. And I've been asked many times, why don't we buy the stadium? The simple answer is I'm not sure what buying a stadium would achieve because we have a lot of flexibility. And obviously, with our president, Barry, being very engaged with the club, being a supporter of the club, uh, he helps the club out in all kinds of ways. Uh, without disclosing the details, we have come to a very favourable solution on the rent. And, and I believe we will always come to a good accommodation with Barry and his pension fund going forward. It's not anything I worry about because Barry has been extremely generous and flexible in my time as chairman of the club. And obviously we do have one of our board members, Matt Porter, who works with Barry every day. And Barry is kept up to date with things late and Orient all the time through Matt. So we feel very good on that. Uh, unless Matt wants to add anything to that answer, I hopefully think that uh, that answers the question. Matt, anything to add? No, I think that was a fair summary. Um, as you say, Barry, you know, not as active at the football club as he has been for most of the last 20 odd years, but still has it close to his heart and uh, and he's, he's keen to ensure that it stays heading in the right direction. So uh, the relationship between him as president and landlord and, and Nigel as chairman um, is outstanding. Luke? Yep, moving on. So um, I guess following on the end of that question and, and playing games about fans, Lee Bristow has asked, one possible scenario going forwards is that there will be no crowds for the whole of next season. Have the board considered the scenario and have they got any plans for that? OK, so uh, yeah, the answer is yes. So let me tell you how we're doing our budgeting. And Lee, that's a really good question. But the, the first thing I want to stress is no one knows anything. I mean, this is a, it's like the Wild West. Um, so, so the way we did our budget was to take what we expected the outcome to be this year, which Danny alluded to. Uh, we then did a stretch budget. And I know I've talked to you about this before. We hope to get our losses down to about a million next year. So that was in ballpark figures, the goal for next season. We've then layered on a number of um, possibilities. We've layered on what we call social distancing. In other words, that would make a restricted crowd the number in the stadium. Uh, and we'd obviously have to back that up with other things like streaming. We've also looked at no crowds at all, which is the essence of your question. Um, I think it's worth telling you that the, the, the range of possibilities is it makes the loss about another one and a half million higher than we would have expected. It's tough to budget all these things because you have to make so many assumptions all the way through. But with the expertise of Danny, Simon and Lindsay, we got quite good at modeling. So yes, we have looked at all the options. Uh, we don't like all the answers, but we know what they are. So stage one is to know what they are. And then we are relying on other revenue streams, which are some of the ideas that Danny went through to try and bridge the gap. Hopefully that answers the question. Danny, anything to add? No, I think you covered it well. OK, Luke. Yeah, moving on. So Nick Clark has asked us on social media about how the search for a shirt sponsor is going. 
this is uh, a, a good one. I'm going to let Danny handle that because it's uh, uh, a really interesting one. Uh, yeah, naturally, uh, these things take time. I want to take that opportunity to thank Dream Team for their support over the last two years. Uh, they've had a change of strategic direction in terms of how they handle all of their sponsorships. And we were informed of that uh, change at the start of this year. Uh, we're close to being able to announce uh, what we've been with, with an exciting and engaging uh, shirt sponsorship and more on that to follow in, in the coming uh, days and weeks. So uh, watch this space on that one. It's exciting. And I want to call out someone who does a great job on this is Josh Stevens, who's very involved in what Danny's just talked about. Uh, he's really built up tr a terrific group of sponsors and anyone interested in sponsoring We've tried very hard in the last year to really add value to your sponsorship. And we've done all kinds of things involving Kent, myself, and make sure that the sponsors are very engaged during this difficult period. So next question, Luke. Yeah, moving on, another one from um, another Nick on social media who's asked, uh, what is the cost for developing the ground infrastructure, e.g. turnstiles? To, uh, to accommodate scanners for season cards. Is it a necessary investment in the current highly uncertain climate? OK, that's a tough question, so I'm not going to answer it. So over to Danny. <laughs> yeah, it's probably worth stressing that we're not replacing the turnstiles. We are merely putting in well, it's pretty much a mobile phone uh, for the scanners. That will enable uh, fans to not have to have 23 individual tickets. I know some of them like that, but cost wise and environmentally friendly wise, that wasn't the, the greatest thing. Uh, there are quite a few trees to be chopped down. But all joking aside, we believe the new system with Green 4, which will be live for the start of next season, uh, will enable fans to be basically have their ticket purchase, their season ticket purchase on a card, and the very cost-effective scanners that we've purchased via our partnership with Green 4 are very cost-effective and will deliver a number of benefits to the club uh, for us to be able to reward loyalty, to reward spend in the stadium in future seasons. So it's, we, we believe it's a, a worthwhile investment that will enable us to move forward and understand our, our fans even better so we can uh, tailor, our need, tailor our, ourselves to their needs. Uh, I would add, if we're playing under social distancing guidelines, it may be that the turnstiles are a problem. We have to find another way of letting people into the ground because people would have to touch them and go through them. And I think, Danny, it's fair to say this would be helpful in that situation. It would, and that's, a, yeah, that's the scenario that we're working through operationally at the moment of how that logistically, if required, would work. Okay, Luke. Luke, we can't hear you. Yeah, apologies. Um, so the final question from social media um, is again from Jamie Stripe, who's asked, how do the, uh, the players feel regarding a return to action and have the PFA laid, laid down any conditions in regard to this? OK, so I'm going to start off by saying, firstly, uh, despite what you read in the press, I think the PFA and certainly our player representatives are acting very responsibly. I think they have a very difficult job. So I'm not one to slate the players at all. Um, and uh, I'm going to let Martin and or Ross answer this and then come back and tell you a little bit about how I see the process going forward. So Martin? Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to pass it over to Ross, let Ross answer one. Thanks, Mark. Um, I think um, I think one real good thing that comes out of this whole scenario with, with the players and, and with football in general is I think it brings footballers closer to, to normal life to because you know, we're all going through the same experiences. We're all going through the ups and downs and the turmoils and the uncertainty, at, you know, at this, at different stages of dealing with it all. So I think when it comes to, to our players and, and, and talking to them every day, I, I think the biggest thing that I've found is they have the same concerns as, 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 a, as a friend of mine that I might speak to about how their lives are going to go back to normal. So I think it's very difficult to pigeonhole one response because we're talking about 27, 28 players across the whole squad um, and they'll all have their own different opinions and different ideas. I think the one thing that is at the front, forefront of all of it is they're keen, excited, uh, chomping at the bit to get back and, and playing again and, and training again and preparing themselves, for, you know, to go into games and, and hopefully you know, a season of some sort, whatever that might look like. So I think it's very, very difficult to uh, summarise 
exactly what each one of them is thinking, but because I think it's so widespread, as it would be if you, you know, if you were if you were hosting a Zoom call with anybody that were working in an office. I think it's a a real uh, coming together of a number of different opinions. But like I say, on, on the whole, um, every time that I have communication with with all of the players and the staff, it is about the enthusiasm to to get back to doing something that pretty much everybody is uh, is all they know. Ross, thank you. Uh, what I would say is, I think going forward, the discussions between the PFA, the EFL, the Premier League, uh, and probably the government are going to be critical. Um, I think, you know, the players have, and, and this is the bit the press doesn't always get, have, have actually showed quite an open mind, haven't they, Ross, to all kinds of scenarios. And, and you know, we've heard players uh, talking um have said and it's been reported back to the clubs that the players understand that they have to share in the pain uh, and that's something that I think is critical for our shareholders and our fans to know so I think everyone's got an open and constructive mind to this and I think we will continue to take guidance from what comes out of those discussions which are all being held at league level. Nigel I think what's really important on that as well is he's probably for a number of, of, of our players, it, for the first time in their careers, um, they've been exposed to something that broadens their horizons and their knowledge about how football works, uh, how football finance works. Um, and I know it's been touched upon already about the inclusion um, that the board have, have, have brought to the staff across the board, but all the players, I think for the first time in, 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 a, in a number of, people's careers and I include myself in, in this as well is that we're being exposed to some real big decisions we've been exposed to some information uh, by our board because they want to be inclusive so for the first time in, in in their in their careers however short or long some of them may be they're really starting to be um, given a broad understanding of what football's all about what football's going through um, and how that relates to the wider world because I know everybody will, you know it won't won't take too much explaining that that footballers do live inside that bubble, and I think for the first time for a number of them, they've been they've been exposed to what goes on within that bubble on a broader scale, um, and then how that affects the wider world as well. So from that perspective, I think it's um, it, it, it's making a strong impact on 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 our squad anyway. Yeah, and I think it's worth telling our fans that the numbers we've heard at league level is that fourteen hundred footballers will be out of contract at the end of the season. So obviously that's a, a large number. Luke, next question, please. Yep, so we'll go on now to the messages that have come in from um, from this team's meeting. Um, and we'll actually just start with, a, with a, a message of support from David Dodd, the um, LOSC chairman, um, who said, with the current COVID-19 crisis casting doubt as to when football in front of the spectators at the Brea Group Stadium will resume, we all realise how difficult it is going to be to sustain EOs going forward. Since last August, the supporters club has donated some £50,000 to Leighton Orient and our committee with the backing of our members. We'll be making every effort to continue to assist the O's financially and to, help to, and to help in practical ways once the stadium begins to be geared up for spectators again. Whilst appreciating that finances are very tight for so many people, we urge LOSC members, fellow shareholders and the wider fan base to do their best to support the recently introduced fans crowdfunder scheme and various funding initiatives that the football club will be putting forward and to renew season cards as early as they can possibly afford to do so. Our supporters club bar is our main source of income and the focal point for members to gather and take part in our various fundraising activities. Without the facility for the foreseeable future, it'll be a difficult season ahead and we ask members and those fans to sign up with LOS, LOSC for 2021 and play a part in helping us to assist the O's. Our committee thanks those fans for their ongoing support and urge everyone to keep safe at this unprecedented and difficult time in all our lives. Come on you O's, David Dodd. So David, uh, thank you for your very sincere, your great leadership. Uh, I don't go to many away games, but always great to see you at those games. Uh, and thank you for everything you've done. But I think it's worth sharing with our shareholders and fans right now that when we come out the other side, based on a number of us being in the restaurant and retail industry, I think pretty strong social distancing will uh, prevail. Um, the supporters club has a, quite a big club, obviously, um, downstairs in the West End. 
uh, just in Edinburgh stand, of course, now. And uh, they will have to, I'm sure, obey some kind of social distancing protocol. So that will be a struggle for them. And also in late November, we'll probably have to follow the same kind of protocols. I mean, in the States, generally for restaurants, you can think about a capacity of about 30% is the guidelines that are expected in the states that are opening up like Florida. Um, so that obviously is a problem. But interestingly, at Lake Norrient is also an opportunity. I mean, a lot of people will have family functions, be they weddings, unfortunately funerals, birthday parties, and we've got two big facilities where we can do significant social distancing. So that's one thing we intend to take advantage of if and when we move beyond the current lockdown. And I think the guidelines in the UK at the moment is no more than 10 people in a group. Uh, obviously, over here in the States, different states have different uh, rules at the moment, but probably I think we're going to end up with something like 50 to 70 as a norm. And that's obviously an opportunity for Lake Orient with our function rooms. But David, thank you for you and the supporters club for all your support. Luke? Yep. So <clears throat> continuing with questions that have come in, um, some of them might go over areas we've already covered. So if I do ad lib you slightly, apologies on that. Um, Adam Parks has asked um, regarding behind closed doors and, and whether the club will be planning to make streaming season cards available. Um, so I, I guess we can kind of open that one up a bit wider and ask about maybe streaming plans in general. OK, so funny enough, we've got a streaming meeting right after this, but Danny, over to you. And then um, I may let David say a few words about streaming in general as well. So firstly to Danny. Yeah, streaming's been an important product for us now for the last year and a half. Moving into uh, the remainder of this season and next season will become absolutely paramount if we are to be playing in front of a reduced crowd or behind closed doors. So we're working very closely with our partners. We made a decision uh, and the board made a decision, a very wise decision to move from the EFL given platform to our own platform. That means a little bit more that we're in control of our own destiny in terms of how our streaming works and that we make more of a profit from the streaming than maybe other EFL clubs are able to that are on the platform. So we very much will be taking uh, guidelines that said from the EFL on how that streaming will work. One of the key factors will be whether or not the 3pm law is loosened where you can't te technically broadcast or stream a game at 3pm uh, on a Saturday. That may be a rule that has to be relaxed if we are playing in front of a reduced or no crowd. We'll be launching a number of packages, whether they be by game, by month, by season, uh, whether you're overseas in the UK. Uh, so yeah, rest assured, uh, Adam uh, and others that have asked those wise questions, we'll be doing absolutely everything we can and we want to improve the streaming product and make even more people watch it. And uh, yeah, I think wise to, to hand over to David, who's just been uh, a mastermind behind this from the board's perspective. Thanks, Danny. Uh, yeah, I mean, Danny pretty much uh, answered it, said everything I would say. I mean, the only thing is, is we, we continually look to how we can improve the platform and the capabilities. Um, and we'll continually review that on a, um, uh, monthly basis. Uh, we're working a lot with the Football League and what can be done there and how we can make the games as widely available as possible to as many people as possible. Um, the, the one thing is that we would all ask uh, and it's very important to our sustainability going forward is, is as many uh, fans watch the platform as possible uh, in the UK when available and internationally it's, it's paramount to our success. So um, we, we very much uh, look forward to you all participating in our way forward. Thank you. So I think it's inevitable that if we have behind closed doors or social distancing, that virtually every game, in my view, next year will be streamed. Uh, so streaming is going to be absolutely critical home and away. Uh, and I think we made two really big decisions which didn't seem that big at the time but are important decisions one is as danny said we moved away from the efl i follow platform that actually helps us in terms of our margins at the club and secondly we made the decision mid-year to build our own app because a lot of fans quite rightly complained they couldn't watch it on their phone or their tablet so that gave us a lot more capability 
So we feel that we're right on top of streaming and every day we come up with new ways of thinking about it. And this is a very, very important initiative going forward. All right, let's move to the next question, Luke. Next question is from David Worsfold, who's asked, how has the pandemic hit the ambitious plans for expanding income from overseas soccer schools? OK, so I'm going to pass that over to Martin uh, and uh, he'll take it from there. Thanks, Nigel. Uh, oh, Martin, you think you muted yourself there. Uh? Thanks, Nigel. Uh, we, it hasn't affected us at all at this moment in time. Uh, the ones that we got planned uh, in America are in August, and we're we're currently talking to uh, both parties in terms of that they still want to do a overseas camp. Uh, the one in Denmark is also in August, uh, but of lesser people. So at this moment in time. We, it, it hasn't affected us, uh, but going forward, <coughs> we're not too sure of how it's going to work. It may be a case of uh, each individual state. We do one in Uptown, uh, New York, and we do one in Boston. It all depends what the rulings are on uh, how big the gatherings are. It may mean that we're breaking it down into smaller groups uh, and maybe putting three or four on in one day rather than just one big group in, in a day. So we're, we're, we're working with it, uh, but at the moment it hasn't affected us uh, going forward. We did have one uh, uh, very keen people in New Zealand uh, that we, we was looking to maybe put on this summer, but we've put it on the back burner for next year uh, because of the because of the COVID. And obviously it's, uh, it's an awful long way to go. Uh, and we've got enough trying to organise the ones that are already uh, pending for uh, this summer, uh, but uh, we are we're hoping that we can we can work around it and still make it a side of the, uh, the club that's making money. Martin, uh, thank you, and I should call out Steve Embleton, who of course is Ross's dad, who does an awesome job. And as uh, teams I coach here in Wellesley, Massachusetts, uh, they love Steve. Steve's such a great guy on these. Uh, uh camps and really does a terrific job and the covid may actually help us because wellesley where we will hold one of the camps think we're going to see such a large pickup as it's towards the end of august assuming we can play they're going to be desperate for playing football and they have a lot of room where as martin said they can break them down into small groups so we're relatively optimistic because august is at least three months away so hopefully they will go ahead. Right, Luke, two more questions, please. Um, go to a slightly different angle on this one then, which is further down from Nick Clark. He said, um, how has the club retail shop fared since coming in house? OK, so I'm going to suggest that, that firstly we start off with Danny and then let Marshall make any critiques that he thinks uh, worth sharing with everyone. Danny? Uh, yeah, as I say, we've enjoyed uh, the highest sales we've had in many, many years. Uh, that was on the back of obviously last year's success with with, with Wembley and obviously winning the league. Uh, we've learnt lessons along the way. Uh, there's definitely bits that we can improve upon in terms of the range. On I'll pass that one over to Marshall in a second. But we, we we've got an exciting range of kits that will come online uh, and more details to follow on that. And we want to expand our range. We want to expand the online. I mentioned about the. The, the next day delivery we want to launch at, at some stage soon and yeah there's a lot more to come uh, a lot more that we can do to, to further improve the margin as, as well as the sales but Marshall over to you. <laughs> Thanks Danny. Yes there are you know uh, this year was really phase one uh, of bringing the retail in house and you know we didn't finish the contract with just sport until the end of May so we only had six to seven weeks to introduce this uh, and actually build in a number of new systems. So it's a brand new e uh, EPOS system, uh, a brand new e-commerce platform, um, as well as uh, bringing all of the stock management in-house and onboarding all of the staff, as well as trying to do a mini shop fit. So this season really was phase one. 
there are a number of improvements that we will continue to roll out over the forthcoming season, such as the East Stand shop. But I think the biggest reason we did this as well was to actually own the data. Um, obviously, over the last few years, um, it's been processed by a third party. We didn't own any of the customer data, so we couldn't see what the fans were buying. Uh, and also, we couldn't really market to those fans directly from a club. Whereas now, moving forward, um, once we have this information, we will be able to offer fans a much more streamlined process. And that includes when we start looking at kind of season ticket cards and what can we do with that in the store so that we can offer more of a, 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 a connected experience for our fans. Um, so there are many more things coming on board um, this year and next year. But I just, you know, the main key point is we only have a very small window of time during the off season to make large um, changes to both systems and physical retail spaces. So there is a limit to what we can do each year. And I think last year we had even less time because of the trophy final and then the very sad passing of Justin uh, diverted all of our attentions uh, quite appropriately to uh, working with his family after their sad loss. That's that's right. But and also, you know, if you look until February, we were double digits up from the year before, uh, and we expect to be double digits up again next year, uh, depending upon if fans can obviously come to the ground from the start of the season. So it's looking promising, but there's still plenty more to come. Uh, <laughs> From the uh, from the retail element of it of the club. All right. So our final question, please, Luke. Yeah. So we've had a couple of questions in um, with regards to kind of match day experience and bars, but um, apologies to uh, Kim and Jeff. Um, we'll pass this feedback onto the board, but um, we're going to go on to a slightly broader question um, around overall um, commercial situation. So. The question from David Walsfold is, what is the position regarding sponsorship and other commercial supporters? What proportion are signed up for next season and what proportion are still talking to the club? Um, and and of them, who are definitely on board and, and who are likely to drop out? Uh, and further to that question, what does that last group represent in terms of potential lost income? OK, so I'm going to start off by making a general statement and pass to Danny. Um, something I've said to at league meetings is, no one exactly knows what next season is going to be like. No one knows what the economy is going to be like. No one knows what the world is going to be like. I think we all know we live in a world where in the US we have 30 million people unemployed and the numbers in the UK are pro probably proportionately very similar. Uh, most businesses are supported significantly right now by government support like the furlough program in the UK. So predicting the future is very difficult, but I think a good finger in the air is that revenues overall could be about 50% of what they've been in the past. So we need to work within those guidelines. But to answer your specific question, let's go over to Danny to talk about sponsorship. Yeah, thank you for the question. It's a very good question. Uh, I think the reality is for next season, that's probably too uh, early to be able to answer that question. Typically, sponsorship renewals and extensions and new sponsorships does happen or come to fruition during the close season it's worked on for many months. We've got a number of our agreements, uh, I hate that phrase, but tied up for at least the next year or two. That includes Brayer Group, uh, have kind of, as I said, extended for next season. And so we are on the verge of being able to announce an exciting uh, shirt sponsorship, uh, which I hope to say do in the, in, in the coming weeks. Uh, and all it is, is about communication. It sounds as simple as that. But we've just done you know, simple things like we've done webinars that Nigel and Ken have kindly hosted with the majority of our commercial partners. We did that a couple of weeks ago and we'll do that again. We, we want to understand their businesses better than we've ever done before. We've always done really well at that. We want to understand it as best we can so that we can meet their objectives, put them in front of our fans as much as we can, get them doing business with each other and ultimately, you know, it's the phrase that Ken always makes when we meet our sponsors and potential sponsors, how can we make more money for them? And that's the question that we'll continue to ask because that then helps us become even more sustainable. Danny, thank you and thank you for all you do. Uh, uh, so what I'm going to, um, what I'm going to uh, finish up is say five things. Uh, I firstly want to say thank you to all of you, our fans, our shareholders and and I should add that a number of our existing 
major investors have invested more money in the last year. Um, so we continue to help to fund the club. Uh, we bought in some other shareholders. Um, I don't think it's right that I name them on this call. I know someone actually asked that question, uh, but uh, I'd like to get their individual agreement before naming them. But we have got other people and I expect some more. In fact, we've got some people who are actively engaged in the club before they put money in, helping us with some of our marketing. Uh, the next thing I want to say is that we remain a very ambitious club. We, we're ahead of our original business plan, as was touched on earlier. Um, we basically are working very much towards getting a squad that we believe can get us out of uh, this league in the next couple of years. Uh, I'm not going to put any pressure on Ross, but we expect to see improvement next year. But what we will do for those who had some very specific questions, I mean, some people ask questions about uh, Macaulay Bond and, and uh, Josh Caroma and some other players. We will have a football specific Q&A coming up in the near future. Um, I would have to say that Macaulay Bond has probably sent me more texts than most people in the recent times. I think he's seen... Uh, what a good club is like at Leighton Orient and a club with some problems at Charlton in contrast. So uh, I'll just make that point. But we're, we will find a way for fans to be engaged and ask Ross and Martin the appropriate questions in the near future. Uh, I want to also thank uh, Luke for putting all this together. I also want to uh, thank Jake Cook, who has been interning at, interning at the club for the last few months. He is to help put this together today. So both Luke and Jake, thank you very much. And finally, football is important, but people need to understand it's not as important as keeping well, keeping safe. We're in extremely trying times. And I ask everyone to please follow all the guidelines, which I think appropriately in the UK are pretty rigid and pretty tough because we want to get out of this crisis. We want as many of our fans back healthy in the stadium as possible. But that's not going to happen unless we follow all the very sensible guidelines. And I want to add one last thank to all the thanks to the frontline workers who are doing a fantastic job in the UK and around the world to keep people uh, getting back on the road to being healthy and back at home. So with that, Thank you for your involvement today. We love our club. Uh, hashtag thank you is a message we mean very sincerely. And with that, I'll bring this call to a conclusion. Thank you.